who has a long experience uh, both in the Navy, at the Naval Postgraduate School, and in computer security. Uh, he can tell you a little bit about his experiences in the Navy. I don't know all about those, but I first met him uh, when he was at the Naval Postgraduate School as a student, and then he became an instructor. And uh, he worked for several years at Gemini Computers, uh, and we worked together there. And he went off to Digital uh, Equipment Company and was in their research center up in San Jose. And at the moment, he is uh, president and um, chief. Sole employee. <laughs> Sole employee of uh, Cyberscape Computing Incorporated. And um, he's going to talk today about an axiomatic theory of mandatory access control. OK, Cynthia asked to, uh, I'll, I'll say in advance, uh, to talk about whatever I was thinking about, and so it's it's work in progress, and uh, I guess this is a colloquium, so that's the right place to talk about work in progress. Uh, the last time I stood in one of these slanty classrooms was uh, longer ago than I want to admit, about 1981 or 1982, and I was teaching beginning programming to classes of fill the auditorium students two or three times a day, Fortran. At that time, my range with an eraser reached up to the back row, and that was frequently necessary. Uh, but I don't think I can make it anymore, so uh, you, you're probably safe up there. Uh, this is sort of one of those, it's a little self-imposed self research project that I've been thinking about, oh, for about the, the last four or five, five months. Focus, eh? Can, is that visible now? Inside. Just the little top And so I hope to get through some of this anyway. It's, it's one of those projects that I wouldn't assign to a student because it's sort of flaky and dangerous. Uh, one of the things that I do, I mostly have done architecture in my consulting business, which is defining interfaces and data structures and uh, primarily. Uh, but I have also uh, done formal or informal models for security policies, uh, which is one of the requirements of the old Orange Book. Uh, and so there was a reasonably lucrative business in that field. And right now, uh, the, there are basically two classifications or two broad classes of policies, uh, state transition oriented, or models rather, state transition oriented models, which I'll be talking about today, and trace oriented models uh, that have received a fair amount of theoretical attention, uh, but uh, have, are difficult to apply to a, the design of an actual interface, I think. At least uh, I've never gotten anyone to give me a coherent explanation of how you go about doing that. Uh, and on the other hand, the state transition models sort of look like a very abstract interface. Uh, and so they, uh, for practitioners like myself, they've tended to be uh, the kind of model that, uh, uh, that you work with. Uh, uh, and I'm not going to speak at all to uh, uh, what the value of a model is. That's probably a whole other hour, uh, uh, plus quite a bit of discussion. Uh, but we'll just assume that it's a, uh, it's a reasonable thing to do to put together a, a mathematical model of a policy uh, as an early step in defining the requirements for a secure system. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how, how state transition, how the the standard sorts of models uh, that people write work. Uh, I'm, and then I'll talk about a, a, a critique of that modeling technique that was made by John McLean of the Naval Research Lab uh, and is called the System Z controversy. And that's left the field in something of a theoretical muddle. Uh, and so one of the ways to look at what I'm doing here is it's an attempt to, to work out of that muddle. Uh, so, so that's some basic motivation for what I'm doing here. The state transition model, this probably isn't a very good picture. I did it. It's about 110 degrees up in Oregon where I was working. Uh, but the basic idea uh, is we have the notion of a state machine where you've got some sort of well-defined state, you know, usually expressed 
uh, depending on the formalism you're using in computer-like terms as arrays and matrices and things like that. Uh, or if you're in a more mathematical framework, uh, uh, you might express the state as a set of, uh, of variable functions or, or something like that. But the idea is that we have some sort of well-defined state that represents the current security state of the machine. In particular, it's a representation of who has access to what, uh, which subjects or which processes have access to which objects. And then there's the model will define a set of primitive transitions between those states, and those are these little rectangles here. There's some typically large collection of, of primitive operations that transform that state, and the interesting ones are things like granting access to, uh, to an object uh, for a subject uh, or taking away access. And the model will define what the state looks like before the operation and for each operation, how that operation transforms the state, what it looks like after the operation. Uh, you also have to define an initial state that the system starts out with. Uh, and the basic idea uh, is that you, uh, the classic idea at any rate has been that you state a, uh, uh, you formulate a, what I've called a security predicate here. A security predicate is a function uh, with a logical true-false value as its, as its output. And it looks at the state, it takes a snapshot of, the, of a particular state, and the answer to the question, is this state secure or is it not secure? Uh, and what was always proven about the model uh, was that you would state and prove uh, a, a thing called a security theorem that basically showed that the security predicate was the inductive property of the system. If you started out in an, a secure initial state, every operation would take secure states to secure states, and so you could then reason that the system stayed in a secure state throughout its lifetime. Uh, and that all sounded pretty good to everybody. Uh, and I, the, the classic model in this framework is called the Bell and LaPagula model. And I've written the security predicate in English there. It says, what do you look at to see, and I'm considering only a mandatory or military-like policy now. What you look like is, is you make sure no subject or no process has read access to an object with a higher label. Uh, so that you aren't reading things that are, if you're an unclassed process, you aren't reading secret things. And then something that's peculiar to computer security, no subject has right access to an object with a lower lo label. And because we don't know how subjects are behaving, they're executing untrusted code, uh, we can't let them write information to a lower level because they may be exposing information of their own level improperly and that's called the star property or confinement property. Uh, <clears throat> and I've made the statement here, it was widely believed, and I think it's still widely believed that the Bell and LaPagula model with its defined state and operations and security predicate taken as a whole is a sound representation of mandatory security. What McLean really challenged was the basis for that belief. Uh, <clears throat> now the, the history is that uh, is that John introduced System Z over the ARPANET, uh, which turned into the internet. And it uh, provoked quite a bit of discussion among uh, practitioners uh, in that context. And then he wrote a paper, and that provoked a fairly heated debate. And there, were, there ended up being one of those little incidents you get into in, uh, uh, in academic disciplines where there were sort of uh, dueling papers and, a, and a, an organized debate between uh, Bell and between McLean over uh, what the meaning of System Z was. And it was a classic one of those where uh, Bell was basically interested in defending this proposition that if you took the whole system as a whole, it was secure. And there was no particular reason for people to be running off and, and, and deciding that the Bell and LaPagula model was a bad model to use. And on the other hand, I believe that uh, John McLean's thesis was also correct. His thesis was, well, a lot of people, and I was one of those people, behaved as if the reason the model was correct, was sound, was because of the security predicate. 
and that that, that was a, a good predicate for evaluating transition operations, that if a transition operation took you from a secure state to a secure state, it was a sound operation. And McLean pretty well demolished that belief, uh, if you happen to hold it. Uh, with System Z, uh, it was just the Bell and LaPagula mo model, except you add an operation that has the effect on the system state of downgrading everything to the current level of the, of the subject invoking the operation. So it'd be like dashing into the, uh, into the secure library down here and remarking everything on class. And if you look at the state before you do that, sure enough, the security predicate is met. And if you look at the state after you do that, sure enough, the security predicate is met. And yet, obviously, that's the insecure thing to do. And so the conclusion to draw from that is that we didn't have a very good way of evaluating particular operations that had been defined. Some of us, anyway, uh, and I'll admit to it, thought that, uh, uh, that applying this security predicate to the before state and the after state was a pretty good test for whether or not an operation was sound. And, and uh, John uh, made us realize, those who understood it anyway, that that wasn't true that the reason the operations were good was because they were being designed by people with good taste uh, and experience in the field. And so the challenge uh, is really to understand how to evaluate these opera operations in a more methodical way, other than just say, well, we'll have somebody, we'll hire some high-priced consultant to run out and do us a model. We'd like to have a more methodical way to look at those operations and decide whether they're good or not. <clears throat> I think I'll skip this one. Well, uh, I combined that with an idea I've had for a long time in the back of my head of saying, well, a security policy is really just a set of rules. And the natural language to use, at least the first thing you would try if you want to formalize something, is you use plain old ordinary mathematical logic. Uh, as you find in your your first uh, first semester logic textbook or, or combinatory mathematics textbook, and so and the habit has been to use uh, rather complex uh, formal specification languages that are particularly tailored to state models uh, to do the model. So I wanted to see what would happen, what you could build if you just use plain old vanilla logic. Uh, as a start to write the security policy itself. Uh, now I'll begin, I don't know how familiar people are with various things, but I'll begin with the notion of a formal system. This lies at the bottom of a lot of different disciplines. It lies at the bottom of computation theory. It lies at the bottom of mathematical logic or uh, metamathematics. It lies at the bottom of uh, computational languages, and for that matter, for modern linguistics, uh, doing bacchus nauer forms, form of a language specification. And so it's a pretty pervasive uh, tool. The idea of a formal system is, first of all, I have a formal language that describes uh, a set of well-formed formula. And you can think of that as, uh, if you're a computer scientist, so at least half the people in the room will know what, what BNF is. But it's a, it's a specification of a language, uh, the grammar for a language. Uh, and everything that is a, a sentence of that language is called a well-formed -for formula. And everything else is a not well-formed formula. And then in addition to that language, you specify a finite sequence of starting formula, often only one. Uh, which is your start uh, uh, starting formula. And then you've got some set of effectively computable transition rules that take you either deterministically or non-deterministically from a sequence of formula to a new sequence of formula. Uh, and usually the, the key question that a theoretician dealing with a formal system is interested in is, given a particular starting formula, can I get to a specified well-formed formula? Uh, and can that question be answered for arbitrary starting formula in an algorithmic way? So that's what a formal system is, and I've only mentioned it because it's at the bottom of a lot of different disciplines and different fields. Uh, formal logic is an example with a few moderate generalizations of a formal system. 
Uh, and it's the, it's the first thing you do when you're doing metamathematics or trying to reason about theoretical systems as mathematical objects in their own right. Uh, you have to formalize the logical language you're going to use. Uh, the one we all use that you see in mathematical textbooks has symbols in it like for every x the following is true or for all x the following is true. It turns out that if you're defining a minimal uh, powerful logic, you can get away with nothing but formal implication. You need parentheses. Uh, <clears throat> to make it powerful enough, you want to put in the notion of equality and you need the notion of not. So those are sort of the logical symbols. Uh, and then you define a formal language that puts those symbols together into meaningful logical statements. Uh, it's considered elegant in this field to have no starting formulae. That's just a little st snob test. Uh, they build the starting rules into the transformation rules. The transformation rules are called rules of inference. Typically, there's about a dozen of them. Uh, <clears throat> and the notion is that anything I can reach by starting with the empty set and applying non-transformation rules is a valid inference of the logic. It's something that you can prove validly using logic alone, sometimes called a tautology. Uh, and there are about a hundred or so different equivalent formulations at least that all result in the same logic which is called first order predicate logic with equality. Uh, and that's, I claim, the logic that you see by and large at the, at the beginning of your mathematics textbooks. So that's what we're using as a formal logic. And in this, this work I felt that I had to uh, pick one uh, and so I did. Uh, uh, but I'm not going to go into which one I picked because I haven't done any work with it particularly other than picking one. Uh, now I have a nice misspelled word there. The next concept is that of a first order theory. Now the trouble with logic is it's empty. The only thing you can prove are logical tautologies. So you want to use logic to prove something about something else and so you have to add axioms. Uh, to, uh, to the basics of logic. So here's the recipe for building what they call a first order theory in, in lo mathematical logic. You start with a first order predicate calculus. And then you add some, you define some finite set of proper predicates. These are the predicates in the logic that you're allowed to talk about uh, that, are, that are presumed to be meaningful. Uh, and you, uh, logics also include operations, which are like functions, so you have to have a finite set of proper functions. And that defines the language of the theory. Uh, and we have a slightly revised definition for a well-formed a well -formed formula, a WIF. Uh, it can only mention proper predicates and operations. Uh, <clears throat> And then we add a new rule of inference, and the mechanics of that aren't very interesting. And what you get out of that is a first order theory. And where you find that in a math textbook is if you look under group theory in a typical algebra textbook, it'll say a group is something that obeys the following axioms, one, two, three, four. That's an example of a first order theory. It's easy to formalize that as a first order theory. Uh, you're just adding the undefined terms or the uninterpreted terms of, of the group axioms, uh, you, you're defining what they are and then you're adding the axioms for the groups. The question is what can I prove about groups give from those axioms? Uh, and so now we call a valid sequence of, uh, of well-formed formula a proof within the theory uh, and the final formula in a sequence is called a theorem. Uh, <coughs> Now I'm going to need in what I talk about, if I get far enough, uh, the definition of what it means for a theory to be consistent. First order theory is consistent if there's no proof for any well-formed formula of the form F implies not F. In other words, you can't prove a contradiction. Uh, and deciding from first principles whether a particular set of axioms is consistent is not very easy in general. It can be done and has been done for a number of them. Uh, but you have to do it by induction over all possible proofs uh, and show that each, each one of your, that, uh, that if, 
uh, any proofs of length n, uh, all proofs of length n uh, lead to, don't lead to a consistency, then all proofs of length n plus one don't lead to, a, to an inconsistency. Uh, there's another way to prove consistency, and we get into some terminology clash here, which I can only apologize for, but we're putting together two different branches of the world. Uh, mathematical logicians call a model something that, that is true, that conforms to the axiom of the first order theory. The theory itself is just formal mathematics. It's just nothing. And a model is where you say, okay, I'm going to map the predicates of the operations in the theory to real world or other mathematical operations and, and predicates for a real structure. And then you show that that structure obeys all of the axioms. And if that's true, the structure is a model for the theory. The theory can have many different models. Uh, and, it's, and that establishes the notion of truth. Once you've got a model for the theory, uh, one can uh, establish a notion of truth uh, that talks about all possible models for, for a theory. And I won't go into that because we don't need it. Uh, and it turns out to be a meta theorem when we've established all of this formalism that, that if a theory has a model, then the theory is consistent. And that's based upon the, the assumption, ultimately, that mathematics is consistent or that the real world is consistent. You can take your, your choice of which one you believe the most. That's sort of a metaphysical question. But the notion is, since there can't be an inconsistency in a model, uh, in a real entity, uh, there can't be a logical inconsistency that if you can make it the model for a theory, the theory can't result in an inconsistency either. Uh, and that's a fairly rigor rigorous proof, uh, depending on the assumption that you believe that the, the model structure has no inconsistency. That's called a proof of relative consistency, and it's the one that you usually see. Okay, and so now we're getting to the security-related stuff. So I said, how am I going to apply all of this to the notion of defining a security policy? Uh, well, I, I restricted my interest to mandatory security policies, which I'll define as a policy that's global and persistent, uh, that is not up to the users. It's something that's set by the administration and forced uh, on everybody thereafter. Uh, and I'm interested in mandatory policies that constrain information flow. Uh, I, I think particularly in the military, that's the, the, the one that's of most interest. It says the secret information doesn't get out into unclassified documents or data or repositories. And so here's my recipe for uh, which I invented for specifying a security policy axiomatically. You start with a first order predicate calculus and I'm going to make a first order theory out of it. I include as a proper predicate a, predi a designated predicate of two places called F. And I intend to interpret F in the applications of the, of the policy to mean, uh, to a first approximation, information is permitted to flow from X to Y. Uh, that's what it means. Now we need to tell the theory a little bit about information flows uh, uh, so that we can reason within the theory about information flow. So I need some axioms for how information flow works. Uh, I'm calling them Denning's axioms because I took them from a very old and very foundational paper by Dorothy Denning. Uh, she defined three properties for security. Uh, she said if I have a group of, of access classes, of secrecy classes, uh, it must be true that information is allowed to flow from a class to itself because not making that true wouldn't make any sense. So this is really a uh, not a mathematical argument, but a plausibility argument of how you map this to the real world. Uh, it's transitive. If I send information to Tim and Tim sends information to Cynthia, then it's possible that I'm sending information to Cynthia. It's